Well, good morning. I'm glad you could be with us today uh, here at Grace Communion Hanover. I'm Bill Wynn. I'm the lead pastor, and uh, we'd like for you to join us in person at 7300 Hanover Green Drive. And um, we're um, we're in Old Town Mechanicsville in the old Girl Scout building on the second floor. So um, you can join us in person. You can obviously, if you're watching on Facebook, you know how to join us there. I wanted to also let you know that uh, starting tomorrow night at uh, 6.30 on Monday nights, at least throughout the summer, um, one of our young Liberty uh, students is going to be leading a, small, a youth small group for high school students called Rally Point, and that'll be from 6.30 to 8 o'clock, and there'll be snacks and games and drinks and things like that, as well as a short devotional at the end. So <clears throat> if, you've, if you're a high schooler, or uh, let me just say, if you're a if you're a this year's high school graduate or a next year's uh, high school freshman, you are welcome to join us uh, right here. And um, I promise it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, let's pray together. Father, we um, we gather in Jesus' name um, for the sole purpose of coming to know you as we are known by you. Uh, you, you created us for relationship with yourself and with one another. And, and that, Father, that, that, that relationship between you and the Son in the communion of the Holy Spirit would be the guide, would be the, 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 the foundation of our relationship with you and our relationship with one another. So, God, as we as we talk today about the truth of our being and the way of our being that can only and ultimately produce life in our being, Lord, we, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would inspire and, and divinely guide our conversation in Jesus' name. Amen. So what, is, what does Jesus mean when he says, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life? You know, John 14 is a fascinating chapter in the book of John. It truly is. Uh, in fact, uh, my favorite passage in the New Testament is in uh, the 14th chapter of John, uh, John 14, 20, where Jesus says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you, right? And um, th there is a mountain of good news in that passage if we, if we dig into it. But today, I want to begin in, in um, John 14, in verse 1, and um, this, this is where Jesus is, um, is interacting, of course, with the disciples, and it's right after he's uh, told Peter that, that, you know, there would come a time when Peter would deny him, and um, Peter denies that he would ever deny him, but we know that, that um, Peter did, in fact, deny Jesus th the three times. And, and Jesus here is teaching the disciples very deep eternal truths, right? What Jesus is talking about in the, in the, in the verses that we're going to go over is, is ancient. But, but the word ancient doesn't even describe it because when we say the word ancient, the word ancient implies that we're talking about time. And what Jesus is describing here can't be measured with time. It's timeless. And we can't even use the word timeless because what, what Jesus has experienced with his Father from all eternity in the communion of the Holy Spirit is before time. We can't even say timeless. We do not have human language to describe what Jesus is articulating to us. Jesus is using the language of broken human beings to tell us about something that is too beautiful for our language. He says in John 14, verse 1, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again 
and take you to myself. The literal translation is into myself. I will take you into myself. So what is this passage about? I used to read this passage and I used to immediately jump to my eschatology, right? And eschatology is just a fancy theological word to talk about end times. Like, like the rapture or whatever, we, whatever terminology we use to describe the second coming of Jesus. But if we take, the, the, if we take what Jesus is saying here in, in the context of what he's just been talking about, what's about to happen, and what he's talking about in chapter 14, we know definitively Jesus is not talking about his second coming. Because he says, where I'm going, you can't go. Well, if he's talking about heaven, or if he's talking about the, the fullness of the kingdom, and he says, you can't go there, well, then that's bad news. That's bad news for us. But see, he's not talking about his second coming. He's talking about his cross. I am going to prepare a place for you. Where is he going? He is going to the cross. He is going into death to destroy death. And in destroying death, he's prepared eternity for us. All right. So let's read on. I just wanted to clarify that. And you know the way, he says, he says, I will come again, I will take you into myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Wordplay. Jesus is, is using wordplay here. And, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a teaching technique. It's called the Socratic method, but Socrates didn't invent that. It was, a, it was an inspiration. Who invented the, this teaching technique? Who invented science? Who invented everything? Nothing was made. John says, nothing was made that was made that Jesus didn't make. He made it all. Jesus is using this teaching technique. He's baiting the disciples into asking questions. That's one of the Best ways to teach is to lead people to ask questions that then lead them to discovering the answer on their own, right? When your math teacher is teaching you how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, if they just tell you the answer, well, that's no good. You have to learn how to think it through and find the answer for yourself. A classic example is multiplication tables. We're taught as children to memorize multiplication tables. And I don't know about you, but for me, that was dumb. That was not a good teaching method for me because I think what it did for me was it set me back. Because rather than teaching me the how and why, I just went home and memorized. Three times seven, 21. Well, how do you get to that? I didn't bother with that. I just memorized it. And so it was probably, I was probably in the third or fourth grade before it ever dawned on me that when I was doing multiplication, what I was really doing is a souped up fancy addition problem. When I said three times seven, I wasn't saying some magic thing that I had to memorize the answer for. What I was actually saying was seven plus seven plus seven. I was adding seven together three times. And if somebody had explained it to, to me that way, I think it would have been better just for me, maybe not for everybody. So Jesus is asking these questions to lead the disciples to then ask questions that will help them discover, that open their mind to receive the answer. He says, you know the way. And the disciples are confused. Here's Jesus again, they're thinking, talking in this cryptic language making it hard for us to understand. He's not making it hard for them to understand. He's making them work for it. Because when you work for it, it means more, right? I mean, we're, we're growing a garden again. Um, and we can go to the store and buy cucumbers, probably for what? 
25, 30 cents a piece. I don't know what cucumbers cost. But when you eat it out of your own garden, it tastes better, doesn't it? Because you grew it. You put the seed in the ground. You went out there every day until one day you saw this tiny little thing peeking out of the soil. And you, woo, you got excited. I got really excited yesterday because I found another baby tomato on one of our tomato vines. And I was, the, 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 um, I had staked them and I had tied them up with these uh, strips of old bed sheet that you rip up and you tie your tomatoes up with. And there was a, there was a thread wrapped around it. And I thought, well, I need to get that thread off there because if, if the vine grows and the thread's around there tight, it could choke the vine off. And in the process, I broke the tomato off the vine. It broke my heart because I worked for it. It meant more to me. Jesus is making the disciples work for it because there's value in that. Thomas, he says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas says, Lord, we, we do not know the way. Oh, but Thomas, you do because you were there with me in the boat when I calmed the storm. You do know the way, Thomas, because you saw, you saw Lazarus. Did you forget? You saw Lazarus come out of the tomb wearing his grave clothes. Did you forget, Thomas, when, when you took a bushel basket around and gathered leftovers after I fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves? Did you forget, Thomas? You do know the way. And see, Thomas is thinking, he's thinking like a map. Do you know the way? Are you looking at a map to know? No, no, no. Jesus is saying, you know the way. And then he drops the truth on him, literally. He says, I am the way. You see, the way is not a formula. The way is not some prescription in, 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 our, in our Bibles to tell us how to get to a place or a destination or to some state of righteousness or good standing with God. The way is a person. His name is Jesus. The truth is a person. His name is Jesus. And life has a name. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus is not saying you can't find the way. Jesus is saying to the disciples, I'm standing right here, boys. The way is me. The way is me. And he goes on to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you, if you understand the Hebrew mindset, the Hebrew mindset is always trying to get to God, always trying to get into a, a good standing with God. The Greek mindset is completely different. The Greek mindset says there is no possibility for you to get to God because the transcendent deity is so other, so far above you, so far away from you, so put off by your fallen sinful state that there you'll never get to God so you have to go through these rituals and, and uh, idols and mediaries to maybe get to whatever God is. So at least in the, in the, in the broken uh, cult of Israel, there's the possibility that we can have an intimate relationship with God, but it comes through all these behaviors and, and, and rituals as well. But at least there's the possibility. Jesus enters into that as a human being and says, you know what? It's not possible for you to get to God. The solution to your, remedy, your problem, the remedy, is not for you to figure out a way to get to God. The solution is for God to get to you. And so God in flesh says, I am the way. I am the truth. Remember what we talked about earlier. Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes from the lover of their souls. And looking at it from our vantage point, we go, this is silly, guys. Come out. 
But fallen humanity can't come out of the bushes because of what we have chosen to believe about God. What has then become so rooted in our way of thinking that we're actually afraid of God. There's no way for you to come out. And so the solution is for God to come in. And so Jesus in the incarnation is God in our flesh. And he didn't just come into our flesh to teach us a lesson. He doesn't just come into our flesh to show us a formula. Uh, years ago, we had, um, I had these uh, teenagers come up, and it was impromptu. Uh, right, right before the service, uh, the, these particular teenagers had, had been at church, and so right before the service, I had this idea. So I, I, I asked them if they would help, and they agreed, and I gave them instructions. And we had this one young, young lady that came up to the front, and she was pretending to drown. And she's flailing her arms as though she's in the water, and she's crying out for help. And then I've got this other teenager, this young man. He's, he's going to be the lifeguard. And he, he comes down the middle aisle, and he's pretending to swim. And so what do you expect the lifeguard to do? Well, he needs to come save her. She's drowning. But what I had him do instead was pretend to swim around her three times in a circle and give her a swimming lesson. Now, you've got to kick your feet. When your head goes above the water, you've got to make sure to take a good breath. Spit out any water that you've inhaled. Take a good breath and keep kicking your feet and paddling your hands. And he swims around her three times and he goes back and leaves her there. And everybody in the church is looking at me like I'm, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Pastor, you failed. If this was your object lesson, you failed because this doesn't work. She's still drowning. So my question is, is that what Jesus does? Does Jesus come down in your sorry, drowning state and give you a swimming lesson and then go back to heaven and leave you? That, that doesn't compute. That doesn't make sense. What Jesus does, the eternal Son of the Father becomes a human being to come and get us. To come and get us. I will take you into myself. I will take you into myself. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. And from now on, I can tell you, Jesus says, I tell you this, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. What did he tell Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus in his incarnation, earths. He brings to earth his relationship with the Father. And this is critical. This is critical. Because see, I want you to know, you cannot know Jesus apart from his Father. You cannot know Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit. You can only know Jesus in his face-to-face -face relationship in the communion of the Holy Spirit because that's who Jesus is. You cannot know Jesus apart from his humanity. You cannot know Jesus apart from his relationship with every human being on the planet Earth. Because that's who Jesus is. The um, late professor, the right reverend T.F. Torrance, referred to this as onto-relational knowing. And when, when I was talking to my friend Rod yesterday, when we talk about knowing, it's, it's not gnosis. Right, the 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 Greek, um, the the Greek academic analytical term of knowing, of knowledge, it, it's academic. Um, I saw someone uh, once explain this. The, the Hebrew word for knowing is yadal. It's it's the knowing of Adam and Eve in the garden. This is the knowing that God has for us. The knowing that we're to have for God and to, and for one another is. It's yadal. It's different than gnosis. It's different from academic. And here's a great illustration that I saw once. A chair is brought 
to the front of the room. And the person said, if you tell a first century Greek to know the chair, they'll, they'll measure its dimensions. They'll analyze its construction and the materials from which it's made. And they may say, well, this is a, um, this is a folding chair. It's, um, it's uh, 17 and a half inches from the floor, and it's, it's, um, it's powder-coated, gray, has a fabric cushion on the back and the bottom. There. Now you know the chair. If you say to a Hebrew-minded person in the first century, know the chair, the Hebrew will come and sit in the chair. And then she'll say, well, the, the chair is sturdy. And the chair is comfortable. I feel safe in the chair. That's the difference in the knowing. We were never intended to gnosis God. We were never intended to know God academically. We were always meant to yada the Father, Son, and Spirit. We were always meant to sit down and rest in the lap of the Father and say it's comfortable here. It's safe here. I feel loved here. And I feel fueled up to love others in this place. This is the knowing that we were, we were created for. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, He means that he is the way to the Father. He is the truth about the Father. And in him, his relationship with the Father is life. And that's the only place that you can find life. There is no life apart from the life of God. All life that is truly life has its origin in the heart of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That's why God says not to sin and defines those behaviors. Don't stab each other in the back. Don't betray one another. Don't steal from one another. Don't lie about one another because that doesn't produce life. It's the only reason. Why did God say don't drink tea? Why did God say, oh, for heaven's sakes, don't ever have a beer? But instead, he he tells us not to betray one another, not to bear false witness against each, not to take each other's stuff because it doesn't produce life. Sit down and have a beer sometime with a friend that you haven't seen in years. That produces life. Share a meal with someone. Drink a glass of good sweet tea on a hot summer day and tell me if that doesn't produce life. Share a song, a word of encouragement, some aphorism and tell me if that doesn't produce life. Remain loyal to a friend in need and tell me if that doesn't produce life. Refuse the temptation to gossip about someone and tell me if later down the road that doesn't produce life. You see, we can never divorce our way of being from the truth of our being and experience true life. I believe that's why Jesus strung these three together, way, truth, and life. Because when the way of your being aligns with the truth of your being, it will produce life. And and the way of your being must flow out of the way, Jesus. And the truth of your being does flow out of the truth of who Jesus is. And when those two align, it produces life life. And that's why you see glimpses of it that are so perfect, you want them to last forever. C.S. Lewis described that as joy. Pure and true joy. And joy doesn't always have to be pleasant. Sometimes joy involves pain. Sometimes joy involves hard work. It's painful to sit with someone who's grieving the loss the, the loss of a family member or suffering. But there's joy 
on the other side of that. Sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That's a promise. It's not some fancy or pie in the sky statement. It's a promise. God says, suffering may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Jesus, in Revelation, promises to restore all the years. Not some, all the years. The locusts have eaten. And if you've lived very long at all, I think probably by age four, five, six, we've begun to experience moments like that. Sorrow for the night, but joy in the morning. And if, obviously, the older we get, those experiences become deeper and more profound and more impactful on us. I don't know anyone who wants to be broken. I don't know anybody that wants to be broken. If we sit down and have a rational conversation with a person and say, do you want to be broken or would you like to be whole? I'm going to pick the latter. I think most people would. And wholeness is only found when the way of our being aligns with the truth of our being. And that's when true, good life can be experienced. So how do you get the way of your being to align with the truth of your being? I have no idea. That's what prayer is for. That's what meditation is for. Sometimes our wounds are so deep, so entangled, the tissue that has formed over those wounds, metaphorically speaking, of course, the, 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 the substances inside of our souls that have formed over the wounds to to mitigate the damage or at least stop the bleeding are often tangled together to such a degree it looks like a box of loose coat hangers and maybe we think it'll never get fixed. But Jesus says, hold on. Because see, he alone knows the Father. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, Jesus says, no one knows the Father except the Son. And he doesn't stop there. Because see, it's true. Jesus is the only one that knows the Father. Jesus is the only one from eternity that has known the Father intimately in face-to-face -face relationship with the Holy Spirit. But he is not content for that to be so. The other half of that verse, Jesus says, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Jesus is determined that you would come to know His Father with Him. And that is life. What did Jesus say? Eternal life is this, that you would know the Father and the one whom He sent. And He doesn't mean academically. It's not academic. It's not that, oh, I, yes, I, I, I read the creed, and I believe the creed. God exists eternally as Father, Son, and Spirit, so I'm good. It's, it's yada. It's intimate knowing. Do you trust Jesus enough to embrace his embrace of you? You ever meet a family member for the first time, like, like it's your cousin's kid, and they're already like four or five years old, and you want to go give them a hug? Because you don't know them, but you've known your cousin his whole life, or her whole life. But this kid doesn't know you. So you go over, and you give this kid a hug, and, and he or she is just sort of standing there like, yuck. You know, I'm not sure. That's exactly what we're like. God the Father in the person of Jesus Christ has embraced us and we're so broken and so lost. We're standing there with our 
body's just rigid, straight, not sure if we can trust or not, and Jesus wants you to know you can trust Him. You can relax and embrace Him back. And when you learn to embrace Him back, when you learn to rest in the freedom of that embrace, you can have life and have it abundantly. It is yours. So have it. Have it. Rest in it. Laugh in it. Play in it. Cry in it. Mourn in it. But know it. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Father, thank you that we don't have to read our Bibles and decipher some code or some hidden map. And if we're smart enough or good enough or maybe lucky enough, discover a way to get wherever it is we're supposed to get, to become whatever it is we're supposed to become. Father God, thank you that you not only created us for inclusion, but took full responsibility for it in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to us in our mess as one of us, and for taking us into yourself. Holy Spirit, teach us to believe it. Teach us to really believe it. For we sing the age-old refrain, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And as we celebrate the Eucharist, we celebrate Jesus taking us into himself and conquering our death at the same time, remediating the fall and all of our brokenness. Bless us in it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you, um, if you have your elements uh, ready, uh, we would invite you, of course, uh, to the Lord's table with us. Uh, also, if you if you would um, care to support what we're doing here at uh, Grace Communion Hanover, you can do so um, by visiting our website, gchanover.org, and um, you can you can text um, a gift to 804-409-0445. Now that's the way I, I prefer to do it because it's it's um, very convenient. Uh, to do it that way. And your um, your donations do matter. They do make a difference. Um, the, um, the gospel is really good news, isn't it? It's absolutely fantastic news. And, and I feel like we're just scratching the surface. George MacDonald uh, said famously, good souls many will someday look in horror at the things they once believed of God. And what I take that to mean is that as good as we think God is today, there will come a day when we will know his goodness to so much greater a degree, we will look back on this day in horror and say, gosh, I can't believe I thought so little of Jesus. So bless you in the bread of life. and the cup of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.